Got it. There's the Zoom voice. Okay, so just um, allow yourselves to get comfortable where you are and open your ears and your hearts to the words that I'll share with you this morning. And I'm gonna read from, this is from Jeff Foster. And we're just gonna mute. Linda, are you taking care of that? I can, but I can't, Jurgen's, I can't mute Jurgen. Okay. Oh, Jurgen. Hi, Jurgen. Okay. <laughs> Can All you right. mute yourself, Jurgen? There we go. Oh, maybe. Okay. I'll just start. So this is by Jeff Foster. There is nothing more liberating than being yourself. Not yourself, but yourself. Not the self you invented in order to win love. Not the mask you wear in order to please people, make them like and approve of you, win fame and money and build your status. Not the facade, the games and roles you play in order to prove how lovable you are, how kind, how compassionate, how sexy, how wise, how funny, how nice, how intelligent, how spiritual, how free from worldly concern, but your true self, the one that was there before you invented self, before you put on that false and suffocating mask, the one that isn't afraid of being exposed, of being seen, of being found out, because there's nothing to hide and nothing to lose. The one who speaks truth and only truth, the one you will return to upon death, the one that no mask can create, destroy, or truly hide. Let yourself be seen today. Only illusions can be lost and all masks will burn. That was Jeff Foster. And now I'd like to invite Tim to lead us in a centering meditation. Okay, everyone. Um, I'd like you to close your eyes if that fits for you. And to just feel your body and the kind of posture you're in right now and see if you can move yourself in a way that you're aligned so your head is gently and comfortably balanced over your neck and your shoulders. You might do this by just simply swaying forward and back a little bit and trying to find the middle space on that plane, forward and back, rocking yourself gently. Using your breath to soften. And then just sh shifting to the left and right plane, just ever so subtly finding the middle ground between your left side and your right side. And once you find yourself physically centered, you can start to turn your attention inward, staying with the breath. And just noticing, where is my attention right now? And just tracking it watching it, where's my energy flowing to? Are you distracted? Are there things that you wanna do, things that you're concerned about? Just pay attention to the quality and the content of where you're paying attention. Don't make too much of an effort about this. If you notice your face is straining, see if you can let go of that tension.
Just allow yourself to be as present as you can be right now. And if you find yourself drifting away, you can always come back to the breath. I'd like you to conjure up the image of a tree, a particular tree, maybe your favorite kind of tree or a tree you've seen recently, or just make one up. And just imagine looking at this tree as, it, as if it was representing you and your consciousness or yourself right now. And imagine being able to see the roots of the tree naked before your eyes and all the branches and it's springtime and just noticing the leaves starting to grow off the branches. Just breathe in and imagine having a relationship uh, with the tree as we do. Continual dance between you and the tree as you exchange. I'd like you to pay attention to the roots of the tree as representing grounding and connection to the deepest parts of you, the parts that have always been there since being a seed. And just see if you can connect to an energy of appreciation for who you are and this journey that you've been on called life taking a deep breath in. And I'd like you to move your attention to the branches and noticing all the wonderful things that are occurring there. Maybe the branches are holding up nests so birds can care for their offspring, or maybe there's fruit on the branches. See if you can recognize that we as humans have branches. We call these roles, different hats we wear. And we extend our life energy into the variety of branches. And you might label one branch and say, that's my parent branch, that's my friend branch. And just gently bringing your attention around seeing the connection between your roots and your branches, yourself and your roles. If you would like, you can just sit yourself at the base of this tree and just calmly let yourself be there, present to whatever you're seeing and feeling. And in a moment, we're going to start to transition away from the imagery, away from the meditation and back to each other. Take a picture if you'd like. Hang on to sensations or pictures or any particular thoughts that were sweet for you. And you can take three breaths and start to move around a little bit. Wiggle your body like a tree in the wind. And when it fits for you, you can start to open your eyes. You can roll your shoulders and start to come back to the space you're in, looking around. And yeah, check out a few things around your space, not the computer screen. Just see something. If you can look at something that's alive, that'll 
be good and uh and join us thank you tim okay so tim and i have been um doing some work together he's going to be doing a a three-hour intro program for us in a few weeks and we thought it might be a great idea to have him do this community meeting presentation so he could sort of be introduced to him some of you i think carol said i don't really know tim so let's offer you a taste of tim i guess so in our work together tim because we have been working for what six weeks or so do you want to share anything about what that's been like for you yeah um i i think in where do i even begin I've had um, different experiences being mentored by and having friendships with a variety of people in the Satir community. And I've continuously learned a lot. And one of the things that I'm constantly trying to reconcile and work through is the relationship between roles and self or hierarchy and structure and what Virginia called the seed model. And I think there's a need to evolve this relationship between the hierarchy, um, between our roles and the seed. Um, and so I think I've been experiencing that a lot uh, with, with you, Linda. Um, and I think we've been working, collaborating together to stay in contact with each other on a very human, maybe even spiritual level, um, one of, of connection and dignity and, and even love. Um, so anyways, it's, it, there's a lot, there's a lot of learning, but essentially it's the importance of practicing self-connection and, uh, and we can get into that, what that means more, but, um, yeah, I, I don't know what, maybe you could share a little bit what, what you're comfortable to share by way of context, because I had suggested that maybe we could talk a little bit about our process, particularly what we learned about each other and, and what we learned for ourselves um, as a way of appreciating one another. And, and then I think that would be a good flow into the dialogue. I think that our conversations together have been really rewarding very, and challenging, um, but dynamic and alive, I think in a way that that's where the best stuff is. So I don't know what you wanna add. Yeah, well, I definitely have given this some thought. <laughs> it was like, oh, so one of the things that kind of came out of like us working together, you know, you know, and I, I'm going to sort of talk a little bit about Satir. Satir says that we're all unique manifestations of life force energy. So we're all unique. And in this uniqueness, we have to sort of know that we're going to have different differences. And sometimes people would call that conflict. And so she said that um, anytime that we experience this conflict, that it's an avenue for hope. And it's like, wow, that is really interesting. And so she goes on to say that this differentness, different, not differences, but differentness uh, is like a fantastic gift for each other. So in working with Tim, um, at one point early on, because we were having some differences, Tim's like, you, it sounds like you're conflict avoidant. I'm like, oh dear. It was like, that's probably like not good. So it's like, sort of like, and yet it is good because it's an avenue for hope. So we can learn, I can learn about myself. I can grow. I can see how I have, um, I have room to learn from Tim and to grow through this relationship from Tim. And I guess that ability to remember sort of like our tendernesses and sort of like love that about myself. It's like, yes, there is, and because she went on to say, as we learned how to um, deal with our conflicts, our different differentness from our family of origin. So really being able to go on this sort of journey back of like, well, yeah, what did I learn? And what is that, that I get some anxiousness about like, oh, we're seeing things differently. Somebody needs to be right or wrong. There's that hierarchy model. And like, how do we make decisions when a decision has to be made. 
so we had some discussion about what is collaboration? Um, is, is agreement wrapped into collaboration? Um, so it was really rich. And mm-hmm. I had some tears and you had your experience. And here we are yeah. working together. Yeah. Which is truly the satire model, I think, is that we can work, work through them and grow from these differences. And, and what I want to appreciate about you is um, I, I, I think you were very resilient in uh, being, being true to those values. And, you know, I was interested in, you know, regardless of the outcome, whether we agreed or not, that I wanted us to practice the things that we both have learned uh, from Virginia in terms of how we communicate and how we see one another, how we can prioritize understanding, even though there's, there might be a disagreement, that if we can work towards understanding, that's going to be tremendously valuable. Um, and yeah, so I appreciate that about you. So at a very heart level, that was very meaningful for me and, and actually quite healing because I've had experiences where that didn't occur. And uh, so thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks so much. And it sort of speaks to what Jennifer read this morning about the mask is like being in that, those moments of like, do I stay in the role of the role that I was in with you? And how do I bring in myself? How do I just bring in me and sort of in a way, let go of the role because that life force connecting to life force is where I think it's important, most important. So I appreciated your, your tenderness, your authenticity, um, your determination in our collaborating with each other on a human mm-hmm. level and on a spirit level. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So we've, if it's okay, we'll go ahead and move into, I'll ask you a few questions. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. So I'm curious, Tim, how has um, Satir's work impacted your life personally and professionally? Um, yeah, I think I, I basically found out about Virginia from just reading a foreword she wrote in a book when I was still in grad school. And it, the, the, the title I suggested for this conversation was In Search of Virginia, because I think that's constantly what I've been doing is trying to learn more from her, you know, watching video of her and then studying on my own for seven years and then getting to, to do some workshops with SIP. Um, and getting to experience it and interacting with with, with people and experiencing it was really life changing. And so the the personal and professional for me, uh, there the the lines are not clear clearly defined. The, to the extent that I've grown personally, it certainly impacted my ability to work more effectively as a therapist. Um, I think you know one of one of the the, the biggest learnings for me is. Virginia's um, emphasis on the body and sensation and a feeling and of touch and how important that is to to make an experience real. She would often say, you know, I want to make this a, a sight, a taste, a touch, you know, and so the sculpting was very important to that. Um, so being able to do that and seeing how impactful and how um, in the immediacy of that with people, with families, being able to experience that was, was very powerful. But then it wasn't just a gimmick. It wasn't just a technique. It was very much tied to what we're talking about. It's very much tied to the heart. There's a genuine humanistic um, valuing and appreciation of the person. And I think her ability to touch people that I could observe through the video was something that inspired me, that I wanted to be able to make contact like that. And so that was a very inspiring model for me. And it inspires me and informs a lot of what I try to be as a, as a partner, as a father. Um, So yeah, I've learned, I've learned a lot (laughs) from her. Yeah. All the branches of your tree have gotten stronger or have more life in them. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's, it's tapped me into, I guess, an essence or a self a spiritual self that I don't think I would have otherwise um, been able to contact. And I think sort of where, where I am now with Virginia's work is um, very much actively trying to dialogue with it. And when I, when I read her work, I'm trying to look for how could, what is this, what, what else does this mean? How could this be clearer? How could we integrate it more? Um, 
because I think that it's, you can see there, there's a kind of like magic in her work, but it's not so clearly um, understood. And I think from, from, where, from where I've learned and in conversations with, with people that have studied with her, there's such an important emphasis on the experiential, but I think there also needs to be a dialogue between the, the intellectual and the experiential. So the experiential and the, the intellectual, the left brain and the right brain, brain coming together and being in this dynamic um, mapping. So that's, that's what I'm interested in, never losing sight of the experiential, never losing sight of the body, but having anchor, more anchor points to, to clarify her work. And that has a lot to do with language. So that's been an important part of my study is trying to understand what is she pointing at with her words? Um, what exactly does she mean? Yeah, and it's like when you talk about the magic, it seems like the magic is the life energy, and we all have the life energy. So she did say she doesn't want people to be satirian. She wants people to really be manifesting that our own life energy because that does tap into the universal life energy. So, and we're all so connected. So, how would you um, say that Virginia's work? What what would you say it offers people today? Um, I think you know, I was listening to this um, presentation by uh, an ex existential therapist named Rollo May, um, and he talked about the constant uh, evolution of technique and what he called gimmicks. So his critique of this, the, the psychotherapeutic landscape is there's, you know, I don't know, 400, 500 different forms of therapy now and it's constantly evolving i think what virginia offers is a framework is a is a baseline um grounding around and and she explored and i think her her work in presenting on the seed model is is very important that's why i reflect a lot on that part of her presentation on that part of her work because i think understanding what beliefs we carry about being itself, relationships itself, um, change itself, uh, emotions, what, what are our beliefs about that form the foundation for how we exist and then how we, we live. And um, I think seeing that there's a lot of creative potential there that if we just rely on technique, then it's just become, become collectors of technique, but we don't, we're not sort of rooted in, as much as we could be with our humanness. I think if we start from there, sometimes techniques can be invented or created as the situation demands rather than these are my tools and I'm forcing a particular technique onto a, a person or a, a client. Um, so I think, yeah, I think that's the use of self, the, the reflections on how important that was. And a lot of her work, what I understand, those, those 90, 90 day workshops, she never emphasized like I'm teaching people family therapy. You know, she, she certainly did that. But in the intensive things, what people learned is how to open their eyes, how to really look, how to really be present, how to really project that energy and to be here and um, to take risks. You know, the five freedoms, I think, are a very important part of, of grounding that, those things which update all the old family rules that freeze up senses or emotions or expression and movement. Uh, so yeah, I think Virginia Satir's work has a lot to offer. And I think um, I think having concepts to point to, like I would point to the concept of self-connection as a central part of her work. She would use language like self-esteem and self-worth. Now, self-esteem and self-worth, for anyone here that's a psychologist, has its own meaning. So when you try to talk about Virginia and you talk about self-worth and self-esteem, there'll be quickly a misunderstanding because they think that you're talking about the feelings and perceptions of self, which is an abstraction. And it's an abstraction that changes through the developmental process, but it's temporary. And I think the things that when we're talking about life energy or self or... Um, the face you had before you were born, um, that there's something transcendent to that, that is rooting and grounding, that isn't about uh, a particular form of consciousness, a particular thought. 
Um, and that's that's the place, that's the basis for transformation is connecting to that place. Um, so. Okay. So like connecting to that place, I think that maybe Banlin would be saying we manifesting that, that we're co-creating and manifesting. And I know in psychotherapy networker and not, I don't know how many years ago, there was a, a survey about what the most important thing is in any therapy of all those modalities. And it is the use of self and that use of self does, that is our life, unique life force energy. So, I mean, and I think she would say that it's like, it was never just her. She was manifesting her love energy, which meant that she was also um, in connection with the universal energy of then the wisdom. So that place of intuition and wisdom is, um, is so important, right? I mean, mm -hmm. if you're not, if I'm not with me, then I can't fully be with you. Mm -hmm. So then do you want to say anything about congruence, like what you're learning about congruence? Yeah, I wanted, I wanted to share a, a quick um, clinical example. I was working with someone and just to kind of highlight, um, this person had, has had different experiences of trauma and abuse. And she was highlighting to me her realization, a deep realization that um, she was hearing her nose her whole life but she never learned to value it. What she learned to value was the family rule of make them happy, uh, submit, placate. And so Virginia talked about these as survival coping stances. So that the rigidity of the pattern is for the sake of life. It's the best that that person could come up with at that point as a child. And the part of her that was saying, no, no, that doesn't fit. No, I don't want this. That was however quiet it was, that's that's the place of the self and the construction of the pattern, the survival coping, you know, that's that's the stuff at the branches. And um, so anyway, that's that's one example of this relationship that we have. There is this place that's um, a mystery almost, and it's quiet, but it's loyal and it's always been there. And it's, it's the same no, but we can lose touch with that. And I had this, I, I, as I was coming home from, from a jog yesterday, I had this weird phrase that came to my mind and it was uh, divine dissociation. Divine dissociation. I thought, what the hell does that mean? And I think it, it, it's like, if everything starts as one, if everything starts as, as everything, and let's say, let's use the word God, it's like being has to dissociate itself so that it can be loving towards itself. So I, I see that in that example where it's like a, a, a person disconnects from themselves. They create this, this pattern, but the loving process is reconnecting. You lose yourself to find yourself. Um, so I think that we're all on this journey of trying to remember who we are. Um, and so anyways, that's why I like the phrase self-connection. It's uh I think it's it's it points better than so self-esteem. How, how would that fit with the and the metaphor of the tree? You know, like I'm no longer my roles, but I'm only the roots, or I'm the earth, I'm the well, air. Like if I'm well, I think, myself to bind myself. Yeah. Well, um, it's it's like a an artist that produces art, once they, they release that into the world, they have to let it go. They can't be attached to it anymore. So that gets into like Buddhist thought about attachment being a very important part of suffering. The, hum the human beings, we express things. We, let's say we express uh, in our work or we express through our roles. I wanna be a good parent. I wanna be a good employee. Um, but the roots remind us of who we really are. You know, And you could think of your roots as your yearnings or your values. And when, or, or the thing that the part of you that says no, when it really means no, you know, when Virginia talked about the medallion, your real yeses and your real no's, this uh, wisdom. And then we're living through that, you know, we're, we're trying to manifest through the, the roles, but the roles are very important. They're the expression of ourself. And so um, it, it's, it's, it's not anything that I want to take for granted. Uh, I think it's, it's important. And, and I think that's where this kind of imagery this kind of language helps me because I know people want to be successful. I know people want to do a good job. 
but ha- being able to communicate about that, it's like, yes, do that. Let's do a great job, but let's not lose connection to our roots. And just that, you know, and, and Virginia would talk about, you know, in helping couples, she would support them in staying on their feet. She would literally get them standing on their feet because that's, uh, that's where they can be practice being congruent. Um, so, so I, I want to share, I was reading um, from Helping Families Change, which is a book that Virginia co-wrote in 1975. And she outlines her definition of congruence, which I thought was really cool. So um, the first is congruence is the belief or conviction of the universality of the human being, our common humanity, and that we're all guaranteed similarity and differences. Um, so that's pretty cool. She would often talk about- Can you read that again, a slower? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. congruence is the belief the conviction of the universality of the human being our common humanity and we're all guaranteed uh, she talks about we're all guaranteed similarity and differences so the second part that she talked about is and she emphasizes the full use of the senses the return to the senses so that would be having people sit across from one another to be closer to each other to even to look and to hear and then to maybe even touch. Um, this is part of congruence. And the last is the full use of choice. Um, and, and I've often reflected, I think, choice, uh, sort of playing off the word mindfulness, I think about choicefulness. And this is a resource that we're constantly engaged with. And Virginia often talked about uh, if, you ha- if you're stuck with one option, you're just, you're just stuck. And if you're stuck with two, you're, it's a still a dilemma. You don't have a full choice until you have three options. And the use, the full use of your creativity, your intelligence, your wisdom occurs in your access and your exercising of, of choice as a resource. So, uh, so this is, I think, is a very helpful pointer towards congruence. And the word congruence has a relationship to how I think about self-connection. I think self-connection is the inner work and congruence is the expression of that inner work out. So that that's what I would say is is a relationship. Um, so the opposite of congruence, incongruence, uh, is not being in touch with what is universally human, uh, not being in touch with our senses, and not being in touch with the resource of choice. Um, so that's just something I've I've learned recently, and it's it's helped me um, sort of connect to what I've been working on in terms of self connection, which is going to be the, the focus of the workshop. And a lot of the focus of, of the work I'm doing with people, it's, it's a very grounding, centralizing concept that's, it, it's, it's very, very rich. So, um, yeah, yeah. Okay. I know that Satir's um, meta goals, one of them is to be a better choice maker. And she actually talked about like the sacred yes and the sacred no with the medallion. So then to get that sacredness, we're listening to the whisper of our wisdom or sometimes the yelling of our, of our life force saying yes or no, you know, it comes out of our mouth sometimes before we even are like, whoa, that's a really strong yes or no. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think to to take, to take the risk to listen to that, that energy of that voice takes time. It takes a lot of nurturing. It takes a lot of love and support. And I think that's what she modeled so well. And I think uh, anyone that studied her work for a long time, I think has the benefit of seeing that relationship. She's very active in the therapy, but also very able to create a holding space for people. So, yeah, she referred to herself and she referred to us people that are working with people as change artists. So in really in that she believed that we really needed to be or she knew that we needed to be in that right part of our brain because that's where we have real access to our creativity and our intuition so tim you have this have been referring to this melting the iceberg and it's been a little bit of a hot topic (laughs) do you want to say a little bit about that um a hot know, that's a, melting iceberg a hot, hot melting well i think the first thing i'd say is um anyone that's seen her work uh, I have a, I have an intuition and this is, uh, you know, I have an intuition. Obviously I never met her. I don't talk to her. I just don't know. I don't know how well the metaphor of an iceberg fits with a woman that was so warm. 
you know, she manifested warmth and she was so felt in, in the sense of touch. You know, I think about, um, I had this experience of, uh, you know, of grounding one day I was walking away for a walk and I picked up some ice and I just, I held it and I, and it was, you know, uncomfortable, but I just waited until that piece of the, the block of ice that I held melted. And it reminded me that I was alive. You know, there's a warmth in me that no matter uh, what I'm experiencing, perhaps it, it, of anger or depression, that there's something warm within me um, that, uh, yes, I see a comment, warmth is what melts the iceberg. Um, and, and then we're, we're talking about attachment, we're talking about the holding space. And for me, the iceberg is a very good assessment tool for seeing and looking at what's the pattern here. So you could look at Virginia's uh, survival coping stances, blaming, placating, super reasonable, irrelevant, and you could walk through the iceberg and say, okay, what, how does this look? You know, what's the behavior? What's the feeling? What's the feelings about feelings? That's, that's a useful exercise. Um, and, and grounding in, uh, you know, how is this person coping? The other thing to realize about the iceberg is um, it's arbitrary what elements, what forms of consciousness are there. There are many things you could throw in there. For example, you know, memories, you could throw family rules in there. Um, there's any form of consciousness could potentially fit in there. So I think having the flexibility and the awareness that uh, the iceberg is a useful tool, um, but we shouldn't restrain ourselves to a particular pattern because if we become patternized, then our thinking sort of gets deadened by that. Uh, the other thing that I realized early on uh, when I was first doing trainings was um, what's the relationship between ingredients of an interaction and the iceberg? And they're actually pointing at the same thing, if you think about it. But I think, I think the evolution of the iceberg uh, would benefit from the interactive nature of it. Right now, the iceberg is, I'm, I'm thinking about a particular person's consciousness, but because Virginia's work related to systems and family systems and community systems, I think, and this is something I'm still trying to wrap my head around about a good metaphor for that representation. But um, yeah, how, how can the metaphor also represent um, responses and um, the interaction, the interactional nature? So the melting for me is a good way to signify transformation. And the way that I like to represent what happens after that tra transformation um, is, is water, but also from biology, if you look at what a cell is, if you look at just a single cell, a cell has a nucleus and the nucleus you could see as like the self, it gives the instruction to the rest of the cell and all the other forms of consciousness um, take guidance and leadership from that self. So that's a way of thinking about it that, that I found helpful rather than thinking about everything being frozen. Um, I, I want to think about all the forms of my consciousness as being amenable to my values and my yearnings and my choice-making ability. So um, that's, that's how it lands for me. And that's, that's what I offer and what I would talk about and explore. The, the other reason why melting is important is because I've identified in relationship to Virginia's uh, change process, particular universal resources. Uh, that I talk about being the function and the process of transformation or melting. So, um, so that's, that's the other part of it. So are you saying sort of like the iceberg? I mean, it is sort of a tool in a way, and it is a metaphor for a person. And yet sort of what we're hoping for in this, like um, manifesting our life energy is that we are a drop of water in the ocean and we are the ocean. So we're not necessarily always the iceberg. We have moments where we're in reaction or we're triggered, where then it's very useful to say, what happened? What was I expecting? How did I see myself? What yearning does that, do I have that I didn't know that I want to get met? And then when we're in that state of um, oneness, I guess, which is like the whole ocean, then it's melted. So it's sort of a, it goes back and forth. Is that what you're saying? It's sort of like- Yeah, what? yeah. The, it's, there's a dynamic relationship between form and essence, right? There's times, so it, the, other, the other part of this thought comes from um, my inspiration and, and uh, appreciation for Bruce Lee. Bruce Lee was a famous martial artist, which I think everyone knows who that is. And he has this quote, he says, be like water, you know? You put water into a cup, it becomes the cup. You put water into a teapot, it becomes a teapot. It can flow, so it can be soft, 
but it can also it can also crash, it could carve stone. So that's interesting, right? So the and and the essence of our if you think about your physical body, what's flowing right now? Hopefully everything, you know, digestion, blood, your immune system, like your your neurotransmitters. You want flow, and that's uh, you know flow is a word used to describe. Uh, higher states of consciousness and and the integration of the balance between skill and challenge. Uh, so I think, yeah, I think water and flow are appropriate ways, uh, are fitting ways to describe at least my experience of Virginia. And I think hopefully that, that, that makes sense to people. Um, and to, and, you know, Sharon, uh, she, she sent me a note. She said, cause, uh, cause we've been talking about these things for years now, Sharon lotion. And, she said she was working with someone and the image of, of ice came up and the client decided to melt it. So, I mean, that's come up for me many, many times where that's an appropriate sort of metaphor. Uh, I have a client says, I've been feeling really depressed and I felt completely frozen. I felt stuck. Um, stuck in what? A particular way of behaving, a particular way of feeling, a particular way of expecting, right? So that's the rigidity. What's the transformation? The transformation is being able to look at that and Virginia talked about, I wish everyone had a tail with an eyeball on the end of it so they could look, right? So they, the, the, the externalization of awareness and that process of looking is the melting. It's like, hey, there, that, there's that, there's that. And the, the relating to that is like love, it's connection. It's like, okay, I, I love the fact that, I love that whatever I did to survive when I was five was the best thing I could come up with. And I love that, I can appreciate that. Now I'm gonna hold your hand uh, let's move to something else. Um, so that's that's the way I saw, uh, and I understand that she worked. Um, so melting is is a very important concept to bridge my sort of beginning understanding of the iceberg and and trying to to move it along. Yeah, I like that. And so really, then, our, as a human being, we will always have the iceberg metaphor for ourselves, and we will always have the potential and the ability to be water, steam, whatever water form, you know, the flow. So we have, mm -hmm. both. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. think in the beginning, you said it's like you, you would hope like how the satire model could be helpful. is like to sort of provide either a structure or almost like a linear understanding that was languaged in a way that more people could understand it. So it seems like the iceberg is sort of a little bit like that metaphor that people can maybe better understand and know themselves so they can like maybe reach and manifest your life force energy. Um, I, I would hope maybe more easily, but. Yes. I, Cause I think, I think um, Virginia was obviously such a power. She was a master therapist. So she was so effective with people and once they had an experience with her, um, they would change or they would grow, um, people would change. But I think having, you know, when, when I teach and when I do workshops, I will do a, a little bit of intellectual sort of explanation. Here's the model, here's sort of thing. And then we do the experience. And then, but when we do the experience, it's like, I'm, I'm asking you to take a risk to do something different and, and maybe strange, but front loading it with some conceptual understanding show gives people confidence to say okay he's put some thought into this we're not just doing this thing right whereas you know virginia i think her way in was she was so warm and trusting she'd take people by the hand it's like okay we're going to do this thing and she was so effective in doing it that way so that works um but what i'm suggesting is that uh, a, a stronger theoretical grounding um can also be another doorway in and it has sort of a wider reach um, and I think will help people really understand how amazing uh, Virginia was and how powerful her ideas and her approach can be. So that's that's really my my hope that I can contribute to that in some way. So well, that's sort of that question is like, what um, do you think could help spread her word? You know, her word, her work, her model. And I think that's the answer is maybe a theoretical understanding more. I don't know if you want to say anything else you want to say about that. Yeah, I think um, I think more and more integration, perhaps with with how we understand um, experience, phenomenology, um, you know, neuroscience, like what is kind of current, um, bringing it sort of in relationship to that. That's why, for example, the the use of language that she used at the time, self-worth and self-esteem, 
I, I hope to just change the pointer because I think, for example, if we use language of self-connection, um, there's, a, there's a novelty and you can invent new meaning, which, which is what she was doing with those words. But because there's already uh, definitions of those words, they can get, there could be confusion. And so people can dismiss her and say, oh, self-esteem, oh, just the self-esteem movement. Like that's so like, that's 1980. That's like, that hasn't worked. The research hasn't borne out that that's effective, but that's not what she was doing. She wasn't working superficially with just changing people's thoughts about themselves and them doing affirmations. It was a lot deeper than that. So I, I'm hoping to, to capture that. Yeah, I think in the beginning, before she even used self-esteem, I think that was coined later on, she used the pot. You know, like, what's your pot? Like, you know, what's going on inside of you? Your, your pot being like, what is it? She said the three S's, soup, soup, soap, or shit, (laughs) you know, because we have all of them. Yes. Did that in an interview. It's like, and then that sort of like developed into sort of self-esteem because that was sort of the buzzword. But even in, even in that analogy, um, what Virginia is emphasizing is the content of the pot. Right. What she also did at other times is she would talk about the universal life force energy, which would be more the space, the fact that the pot has space in it. What's that yes. space? That is a container for possibility. But you don't, you know, she would often, and she, she was one of the first people to externalize, you are not your experience. So even though you're feeling like shit, even though shit is in the pot, you are not that. So so again, that this is where she was onto something, but sometimes the way she would explain it would sound like the, the psychological definition of self-esteem. And sometimes the, the other ways that she would describe it, she would transcend that. And I think, um, I think sort of clarifying that is important. Yeah, I yeah. Do too. Good, yeah. thanks. Okay, maybe your last question. What do you think satire communities could do better to grow in the expression of congruence? <laughs> um I'm feeling stumped and I like I came up with that question so I'm like <laughs> embarrassing. <laughs> um I I think it's you know enact embody the stuff that she taught right at the end of the day it's like it's 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 not a, we all know it's not enough to have the insight and to know it up here but to embody it and to practice it this is very important um I would see I would like to see you know, for example, in, in these kind of community meetings or in any workshop, that the five freedoms really be emphasized yeah. and say, like, this is this is going to help us if we give ourselves freedom to see and to feel and to ask and to say and to uh, take risks. The one thing the one thing that I would add to the, the five freedoms is the freedom to move. Uh, that's a particular one because I'm very interested in movement and the body. Um, so I would I would tack that in. So I've, I've sort of adapted the five freedoms so it stays five. Um, so anyways, that's, yeah, uh, that's another thought, but I think that's really important. Mm-hmm. She would say that to love and to be real. And I think with the Satir Institute, one of the things that we've really, um, been evolving is, um, to what we call live our brand, you know, our brand of congruence. How can we live it at all levels of the board, the executive, um, in our trainings as a trainer, as members of the SIP community, and just in the world. So like living that brand of like, we represent and we, you know, Satir said that it's like, this is something to live. It's not just a thing to practice in your therapy sessions. The Satir model is a way of being. And that being level is at the level of self. So I, I think, I think there's a lot of work to be done in terms of creating organizations. You know, I, I have, you know, friends that work in nonprofits and I, I used to work in nonprofits now in private practice, but like, we do not know how to do healthy organizations yet. There's so much to learn and so much to learn from Virginia about integrating that um, in our way of being the most, you would think ideal, um, the most humanistic and, um, valuing of people organizations sometimes fall really short of perceiving and beholding the human being. Uh, So I think that's extremely important. And it requires uh, the high competence in communication and self-connection. I think uh, any good relationship 
depends on two key ingredients, maybe more. I'm still working on it, but self-awareness and communication skills uh, or self-connection and communication skill. So uh, yeah, that's, okay. that's a lot. Thanks. Yeah. So Tim, can we stop here? And you have a um, experience for people and they'll be going into dyads or trios? Um, dyads. Okay. Dyads. Yeah. Um, okay. So how I'm going to set this up is we'll start with a, a, sh a short little meditation. And then um, every, every minute, every minute or so, you'll get a prompt through the chat of what a to broadcast. do next. A broadcast. Yeah. And then um, can I type the broadcast or do you have to type it? Um, you can as co-host. Okay. I'm, I'm co-host. Okay. All right. So um, I'd like everyone and invite you to close your eyes and taking a position that where you can hold yourself with dignity. So an erect spine, if possible, if not, just focusing on relaxing. I heard this wonderful phrase of we relax to meditate, not we meditate to relax. So just bring yourself to a state of relaxation to start. And I want to encourage you all to turn towards yourself, to try to connect, to hold, to perceive, to be in touch with your capital S self. You can use your breath and the fact that you are breathing and that you are alive right now as a good indicator or a good pointer. Feel your feet on the ground and even press a little bit of pressure. Feel the ground underneath your feet and say quietly to yourself, I am here. I am here. So we're going to start to transition you into the diet rooms. Keep your eyes closed. And then we're going to transition in a second. I'll give you the instruction. The first thing that you're going to do is you're going to be joined with someone. You'll open your eyes. Don't say anything. First, um, just look at your partner and come into an awareness of the sensation of, of that you're with another person. So what Virginia talked about, the universal humanness, that we're guaranteed sameness and difference. So just in silence, uh, you do that for about a minute, and then you'll get your next instructions. So this just think this is a continuation of meditation, okay? But it's going to be interpersonal meditation. Uh, so if, uh, Linda, I don't know if you could set that up in terms of... I have Jennifer's got it. Oh, Jennifer's going to do it. So setting them up in diet. So you're just going to, for one minute... Tim, is it all right if there's one trio? Yes, I guess that'll that'll work. Yeah. Or actually, there might not be. I just wanted to. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Are we going into yes. the mm -hmm. rooms now? Yes. Okay. Has everyone joined? I need to just move some. Oh, okay. Some people leave and some people 
I'm just making sure everyone's joined. Is Jane there? Oh, Lanny hasn't joined. I might need, to, oh, okay, I'm gonna move. So do you see how to broadcast him? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm just gonna. Jane hasn't gone. Hold on. Um, oh, there she goes. I think everyone is paired up. I'll just give it 30 more seconds. Yeah, there's one trio. Okay. <clears throat> Oh, there's Jermaine. Oh, he just rejoined, I think. Oh no, he's not, he hasn't joined. What should I do? Um, I you can what. move him. Yeah, that's what I'm gonna do right now. You move him to. Yeah, and then I'm move him back. Oh. And Lanny, oh, Lanny's good, she's gone now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's all you, Tim. Okay. Yeah. I'm just going to send them. So are they staying in there? Tim, you're yeah. sending them instructions as they're yeah, in yeah, rooms? yeah. Okay, and then I'll send it. them. I'll send them an instruction to then kind of discuss the experience. So I'm I'm just getting yeah. them to reflect on yeah. emotions, and then, um, and then finally they're going to do intentions and yearnings. Okay. Oh, we're still recording. I'm going to stop the recording. There we go.